Número 1. Cornelius Vanderbilt. He was known as the Train King. Just five days after the end of the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln was the last of the 600,000 victims of the bloody conflict on American soil. The country was divided, and the world saw American democracy as a failed experiment. But most people don't realize a new era is dawning. The country is entering an era of development, and in the void left by the greatest statesmen we have ever known, new seeds of leadership will appear. People like Rockefeller, Ford, Carnegie are the first generation of the most successful people in the business world, or the present buffets, Jobs, or Gates. They are the people who shape American standards. In the early days of this young nation, the person most capable of leading America was not a politician. He was a man who got rich from nothing. With his determination, he turned the poor wharves of New York Harbor into an empire. At the age of 16, Cornelius Vanderbilt bought a small boat with $100 borrowed and quickly became known as a decisive businessman, using every means to move forward. Back then, it was pure competition. My mind versus yours. My efforts oppose your efforts. He has to fight constantly. And that's how they look at business. In the Wild West, whether legal or illegal, it's all about winning or losing, and it's best to win. He's a tough guy. Getting into fights with other people, beating them to a pulp and leaving them unconscious. That ability to confront and toughness greatly influenced his personality. His small ship quickly turned into a fleet, transporting goods and passengers to every corner of this developing country. Vanderbilt became synonymous with transportation and he was nicknamed Commodore. I think Vanderbilt realized that what was going to be important was getting goods from one place to another. And he thought about the necessary infrastructure and not the infrastructure that the government built, but that he provided. Over the next 40 years, Vanderbilt built the world's largest transportation empire. Then, at the height of his power before the Civil War, he did the unthinkable. Every job depended on the Transcountry Railroad and Admiral Vanderbilt realized that it would radically change America, shortening cross-country travel time to months. Railroads were completely free because railroads allowed for cheaper and more efficient transportation from one part of America to another. Vanderbilt saw his future. He sold all his ships and invested everything he had in the railroad industry. People often say, Recognizing opportunities is an element of success. That is the difference of a good leader. Not many people have that. Not many people foresee the opportunity. That is the characteristic of great leaders. His decision to invest heavily in the railway paid off. After the war, Vanderbilt was the richest man in America, with a fortune of more than $68 million equivalent to $75 billion today. But that money could not help him avoid the devastation of war. After the Civil War, the country mourned openly, while Vanderbilt kept it private. The first card is about the past, the second is about the present, and the third is about the future. It was an unexpected loss. Someone very close to him. My son, George. It died in the war. What about the future? Horse wagon. There will be a war. The war is over. Or not. His battle is about to begin. Hey, pay attention, old man. Vanderbilt was tormented by the death of his beloved son. His empire more vulnerable than ever. For Vanderbilt, it was a great tragedy. He had a son who had the same physical strength and talent as him, but he died too young. It was a difficult problem for the admiral. Vanderbilt spent years preparing George to take over the family business. And now, the admiral is forced to put his trust in his other son, William, who is less talented. I appoint you as CEO of Hudson Railroad. 
Vanderbilt forced William to enter into negotiations with the owners of rival railroads. So let's set a price. If you give us the goods you transport all year round, we will give you the privilege of allowing your passengers to go to Manhattan for 200000 That privilege is not worth 200000 How about 100000 It was a fair and generous offer. I'm not interested in your generosity. I'm only interested in the deal that's best for my shareholders. And it does not include receiving more than $100,000 or even just $1. My father only wants what he thinks is right. The problem is, my father doesn't understand what's right that he did the unthinkable. Every job depended on the Transcountry Railroad, and Admiral Vanderbilt realized that it would radically change America shortening cross-country travel time to months. Railroads were completely free because railroads allowed for cheaper and more efficient transportation from one part of America to another. Vanderbilt saw his future. He sold all his ships and invested everything he had in the railroad industry. People often say, recognizing opportunities is an element of success. That is the difference of a good leader. Not many people have that. Not many people foresee the opportunity. That is the characteristic of great leaders. His decision to invest heavily in the railway paid off. After the war, Vanderbilt was the richest man in America, with a fortune of more than $68 million, equivalent to $75 billion today. But that money could not help him avoid the devastation of war. After the Civil War, the country mourned openly, while Vanderbilt kept it private. The first card is about the past, the second is about the present, and the third is about the future. It was an unexpected loss. Someone very close to him. My son, George. It died in the war. What about the future? Horse wagon. There will be a war. The war is over. Or not. His battle is about to begin. Hey, pay attention, old man. Vanderbilt was tormented by the death of his beloved son. His empire more vulnerable than ever. For Vanderbilt, it was a great tragedy. He had a son who had the same physical strength and talent as him, but he died too young. It was a difficult problem for the admiral. Vanderbilt spent years preparing George to take over the family business. And now, the Admiral is forced to put his trust in his other son, William, who is less talented. I appoint you as CEO of Hudson Railroad. Vanderbilt forced William to enter into negotiations with the owners of rival railroads. So let's set a price. If you give us the goods you transport all year round, we will give you the privilege of allowing your passengers to go to Manhattan for 200000 That privilege is not worth 200000 How about 100000 It was a fair and generous offer. I'm not interested in your generosity. I'm only interested in the deal that's best for my shareholders. And it does not include receiving more than $100,000 or even just $1. My father only wants what he thinks is right. The problem is, my father doesn't understand what's right. That old man should retire. The message was clear. Opponents are no longer afraid of Vanderbilt. People always want successful people to fail. The day people stop targeting you means you are no longer at the top. But where they saw a weakness, the Admiral saw an opportunity to assert his dominance and teach William how to be a Vanderbilt. If they want war, I will give them war. Vanderbilt owns the only railroad bridge into New York. It is the gateway to the country's largest port, supplying goods to the entire continent. Vanderbilt knew it was the hammer he needed to force his opponents to submit to him. Sit down. I want you to close the Albany Bridge. Without this bridge, other railroads cannot enter New York. In essence, Vanderbilt single-handedly locked down the nation's largest city, cutting it off from the rest of the country. 
he has asserted his dominance. Ladies and gentlemen, the train will go no further. We will stand and watch them bleed to death. The Civil War left behind a pile of ruins. For the first time in history, the country had to be rebuilt. More than 50,000 miles of railroads transformed the country. Admiral Cornelius Vanderbilt grew up poor but built a railroad empire, making himself the richest man in the country. At age 72, he lived 30 years longer than the average life expectancy at that time, and his opponents considered him senile. It was a mistake they regretted. Entangled in a battle to control the railroad connecting the eastern Mississippi, the admiral had nothing to lose. Blockading the bridge kept millions of tons of goods from reaching the rest of the country, and his opponents gradually ran out of energy. Before the stock became a pile of paper, the president of a rival railroad company tried to sell all of their stock. The news quickly reached Wall Street, causing a massive sell-off. Come on, put your money in. Come on. New York Central stock price fell very quickly. How much? $20 per share. Buy as much as possible. Vanderbilt bought all the stocks that were flooding the market at bargain prices. Three aces. Well, that's good. Within days, Vanderbilt took over the rival railroad company, creating the largest single railroad company in the United States. The New York Central Railroad became the center of his empire, and it came to him as a result of a skillful campaign of revenge. Railroads crisscross America, connecting the country together in ways that were unimaginable just 15 years ago, and providing over 180,000 jobs. Installing roads became an unprecedented engine of growth for America. Railroads allowed industry to boom in unprecedented ways. Another step forward, an important one led by the railroad, was the need to fill the gap between the east side of the Mississippi and the west coast. Vanderbilt made himself the sole king of the railroad industry, and now he wants the world to know it. He envisioned a monument symbolizing his vast power. Workers will begin construction on a station connecting three railroad companies, Harlem, Hudson, and Central. It will be the heart of New York, and it will be called Grand Central Depot. Thousands of workers labored for two consecutive years. It was an urban construction project the likes of which America had never seen. Grand Central is the largest building in New York City and the largest train station in the country, occupying an area of 90,000 square meters, 22 acres. That giant building was taller than all other buildings in New York at that time. It was a physical symbol of the giant and power of the Vanderbilt Railroad Empire. The growth of the railroads pushed America into its greatest national expansion ever, led by a new breed of leaders. Cornelius Vanderbilt, one man, overcame violence and oppression and built a monopoly in the railroad industry. Now he owns 40% of America's railroads, but he wants it all. Chicago is the fastest growing city in America. The route connecting Chicago to New York is the busiest and most valuable route in the world. And it doesn't belong to Vanderbilt. To complete his empire, he needed to gain control of the Erie Line. Vanderbilt has an advantage of millions and millions of dollars. Bottomless pockets. Unlimited money is always an advantage when you are trying to gain control of an organization. Vanderbilt instructed his representatives to buy as many shares as possible. Before Erie, before Erie, asked to take control of the company over the weekend. Buy Erie for 45. It was a classic Vanderbilt move that he pioneered, now known as forced acquisition. Erie bought it for 50, but his efforts were hindered by an even more ingenious idea cooked up by two unknown people, Jay Gould and Jim Fisk. After years of watching the Admiral rule, they were eager to build their empire. 
they recognized Vanderbilt's plan to buy the railroads and saw the opportunity they had been waiting for. Competing, I think it's a good system and it's really, it's a business, it's about doing a good job and competing with your competitors. Gould and Fisk began printing the new stocks using a printer they kept in the basement of their Erie office. Each share they printed reduced Vanderbilt's stake in the company, and they printed more than 100,000 shares. There are several provisions in the Erie corporate charter that allow the board of directors to issue additional shares without notice to shareholders. And so, the more shares Vanderbilt bought, the more he had to buy to gain a majority. That plan became known as flowing water wears away stones. Today this is illegal, but at that time it was never thought of. The simply genius. And on Wall Street there has never been anything like that. There is only one rule. There are no rules. No matter what method they use to push their opponents out of the game, they will do it. Not knowing that, Vanderbilt continued to buy. Imagine what his face looks like. Oh God! I wish I was a fly on his wall. The newly printed shares were delivered by hand to Vanderbilt. This is Erie stock. I think we control that company. Shallow cup. Shallow cup. Drink for money. For Vanderbilt's money. Vanderbilt purchased $7 million in shares printed by Gould and Fisk. Today, that amount is equivalent to $1 billion. Railways connect large areas of the country. Controlling them means power that no one could have imagined just five years ago. A lot of people placed bets. I think there are people in their generation who look beyond their time. Admiral Cornelius Vanderbilt owned more railroads than anyone in the world. But like other powerful people, he faced tests of perseverance. Competition is a very positive thing. People don't know how positive that is. And sometimes you don't even hear about it because what's going on behind your back isn't a pretty picture. At the height of his power, Vanderbilt was played by an unknown couple. Drink for Vanderbilt's money. Jay Gould and Jim Fisk ripped off the Admiral out of millions of dollars. And they want the world to know about it. Thanks, don't mind me. Now, what Vanderbilt wants to do is no longer a secret. He owned more railroads than anyone. But Gould and I struck a blow at the little old man. Now, he may be rich, yes, he may be powerful, but someone has to stand up to that old man. This was a humiliating defeat for the Admiral. A man of fierce fighting spirit who wanted to win everything, and to whom money was especially important. But now he was defeated and publicly humiliated by Gould and Fisk. Gould and Fisk may be on top of the world, but they have awakened the sleeping lion. Vanderbilt vowed never to be defeated again. They don't think about money. They only care about winning. Now, of course, if you win a big deal, the money will follow, but that's not your intention. Your intention is to win. Victory, victory, victory. Anytime. Not occasionally. Which is all the time. Vanderbilt immediately began looking for a new blade. He realized that the railroads were saturated, and the future of industry was not in building new railroads, but in transporting new goods. Innovation is not always a great invention. Initiatives are steadfast things. And if your company isn't innovating and working every day to find innovations, you don't own a company. You will die in the bud. If Vanderbilt could corner the market with new supplies that could continue to fill his trains, he would be able to control the railroad industry. And the Admiral knows where to find it. Oil revolutionized life in America. Crude oil from the ground was refined into kerosene, a safe and cheap source of light, and access to light completely transformed life in America. Before kerosene, middle-class Americans did not have access to adequate lighting. When the sun goes down on the mountain, darkness covers. Petroleum was a phenomenon that changed the world forever. And Vanderbilt knew it would be his next chance to make money. 
Vanderbilt saw demand for oil skyrocket across the country, and he realized the need to provide oil refiners would need a new way to transport oil. If Vanderbilt could corner the market in oil transportation, he would put himself back on top of the railroad industry. What he needs to do is meet the supplier. We're going to extend the North Shore to Cleveland. Why Cleveland? Cleveland is a small city of less than 50,000 people, but it is located on a sea of oil. East of Ohio is today's Middle East, and the areas surrounding Cleveland are some of the world's largest oil fields. Vanderbilt learned there was an oil refinery near the railroad in Cleveland, a perfect culmination of his master plan. He approached the owner, a struggling young oil man whom Vanderbilt hoped to pull from the shadows. That young man was John D. Rockefeller.